My name is John Stevens. I'm the chairman of the Federal Trust, among other things. And I'm very pleased to welcome this morning uh, Luke Groman, who is the CEO and founder of Forest for the Trees. Luke, um, very kind of you uh, to be with us. I'm, this is a very crucial time, obviously, for a whole range of reasons. Um, I was wondering whether we could start off perhaps by saying, what do you really think is the monetary impact of the Ukraine crisis as it's unfolding? I, I think it's an in, I think it's an enormous impact. I really think the reaction to the Ukraine crisis, in particular, the U.S. and EU sanctions of Russia's FX reserves, I think, are a Pandora's box that has been opened, and I don't think can be reclosed. And so I've I've talked about it potentially being on level with uh, the U.S.'s closing of the gold window in 1971 from a monetary perspective. Uh, you already had U.S. and EU sovereign debt uh, credibility uh, under threat as a reserve asset. And, and when I say credibility, credibility is a reserve asset, right? Because uh, given the U.S. fiscal situation, the European fiscal debt situation, the U.S. debt situation, it was increasingly apparent that you needed significantly negative real interest rates for a sustained period of time in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. And the problem is, is nobody wants to hold debt with significantly negative real interest rates uh, because you're just going to lose purchasing power uh, over time. And so the credibility of, of, of Western sovereign debt as FX reserve instrument, I think, was already under threat on its own. And then when you layer on top of that uh, peak cheap energy, where we have seen uh, over the last decade, plus the marginal oil, you know, marginal barrel of oil reserves, that cost has continued to rise and rise and rise. And so here too, when you consider the part of FX reserves that are held uh, for, uh, to ensure the ability to buy energy, to buy needed raw materials, to the extent that the geology, the, the, the physical world reality is dictating that those costs are going to rise secularly, here too, when the debt of the West is in a position that interest rates cannot rise to offset or to compensate um, the debt holder for uh, rises in, in inflation, here too, because of peak cheap energy, peak cheap commodities, uh, FX reserves, Western sovereign debt as FX reserve assets are once again losing credibility. And when you layer on top of these two things, which are probably enough to really indict uh, the credibility of, of Western sovereign debt as, as FX reserve assets on their own, let alone together, when you further layer on the what, what just happened with the US and EU sanctioning Russian FX reserves, which is now, not only do they not, you know, do, are they not gonna compensate you on, in, in a positive real rate manner, not only are they not gonna hold their purchasing power against oil, gas, copper, critical commodities, but now anytime we deem you a bad actor, we can just take them. And so it's sort of strike one, strike two, strike three for, for Western sovereign debt as FX reserves, in my view. And so uh, I, I think what just happened in response to uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, Russia invading Ukraine, I think is, in as we look back in history, likely to be much more uh, impactful than the actual Russian invasion of Ukraine itself. You've suggested that we could be seeing the end of FX reserves uh, per se. I mean, that would entail a, a massive exit from sovereign debt by a whole range of current holders around the world. I mean, it, that is a, a potentially a very serious crisis indeed. Where would that money go? I think it goes into things that better hold purchasing power, right? So it's going to be gold, hard assets, equities. Uh, and so you've seen some move on this front as it is, right? The Swiss National Bank has obviously been printing money and buying U.S. equities for some time. Uh, we've seen shifts by the Russians, by the Chinese out of, out of dollars into gold in the case of the Russians, out of dollars into gold and the Port of Piraeus and the Belt and Road and copper mines, oil fields, etc. by the Chinese. And so I think that is going to some version of that is going to be the model going forward. And, and you probably have uh, a greater percentage of FX reserves not held in official reserves, but instead are, are in the case of China, hived off into one of their other state run uh, wealth 
uh, wealth management uh, uh, um, or, or sovereign wealth funds uh, rather than being in official reserves. That, you know, the sovereign or the official reserves just stops going up or starts going down. And instead, you know, safe ends up with more money and they go invest in inflation hedged assets along the Belt and Road, some gold. And so I think it's a it'll be a broad based exodus out of FX reserves, out of Western sovereign debt as FX reserves. And that, you know, that's a, a $12 trillion pool of money right now, probably 65 percent dollars. Uh, those will go elsewhere over time. I mean, I'm sure there'll still remain some working capital amount of, of FX reserves in dollars and euros. I don't think it all goes away. But I think what we'll see is a shift out of you know, 12 trillion of savings to what's the true working capital amount. And you can sort of calculate that using different IMF calculations of imports, ex exports, et cetera, current account. And that'll be the number held in FX reserves and not a dollar more. And the rest will go into things that better preserve either purchasing power or national security access to commodities or both. But on the third point that you made, the third strike that you mentioned of the impact of sanctions, I mean, in some respects, these alternative assets are even more vulnerable to sanctions. I mean, if you buy the Port of Paris, if, if Port of Paris had been bought by the Russians, uh, that would be the end of the story. Uh, there's nothing they could do about it. Um, and the same is true, surely, of holdings of bullion and of, and indeed of the way in which uh, major commodities operate. I mean, the, the, the US stroke, the West grip on these other markets, commodity markets, is as tough in, in many respects, potentially, as uh, its grip on, on the... Uh, normal form of reserve, so cash and, uh, and, and bonds and all the rest. I, I think that's right. Uh, you, you raise a great point, which is exactly that anything held outside their borders can be subject to seizure. And it raises an interesting point because you often hear, well, the U.S. is not that indebted. If you look at all of the assets of the United States, all the land, all the farmland, the Grand Canyon, the rivers, blah, 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 blah. We have all these assets. And my question is always, OK, great. How are they going to how are they going to claim those assets if they want to? Are those exchangeable for U.S. debt? And the answer, of course, is no. You have to talk to the United States Marine Corps first. And that's yes. that is not a Treasury issue. So I think the answer to your point is, is I think we are going to see the preeminence of not just gold, but of physical gold. I think you're going to see a market to gold is going to gain a significant amount of share in global reserves for exactly the reason you say, and not just physical gold, but it's no longer going to be, we trust to hold it in London, in the LBMA uh, system. We want it, give it back. Um, and yes, again, once again, you will probably see people hold working capital levels of gold in the LBMA system, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in these global financial centers, but the rest of it is going to start coming back to borders uh, inside inside sovereign borders as a, as for the exactly the reasons you say again because a the West does have a grip on the financial system plumbing and then b the you know the control of the deep water you know the deep water oceans is is a problem as well and so to the extent unless you are prepared to go to war to defend it you know you can redeploy assets along you know you can buy the Port of Piraeus but you know, if the U.S. Navy shows up and says it's ours now, what are you going to do? And the answer to your point is not a lot. Now, if you invest along the Belt and Road and across Eurasia, U.S. Navy can't touch you, right? So it, it, there's probably that actually probably does start to factor into not just A, I think a lot more gold, a lot more physical gold held within borders. But then B, I think to your point is, OK, where can we invest that the Western navies can't touch us? Where where do we have a defensible position, right? So, you know, yes, in theory, the U.S. can choke off Straits of Malacca and, and prevent oil into China. That's Cassis, you know, Cassis Belly, right? And, and the U.S. Navy conceivably would take extraordinary losses were that to be the case, being so close to China. So I think, I think you're, it, it speaks to, I think, a wholesale change that is, we're in, we're not even in, in the American term in the first inning of the game. We're, we're, we're in pregame. In Is there really the any, any appetite for this? I mean, the crucial question lying behind the, the current crisis in Ukraine is, is where are China's interests in all of this? And people have been, particularly in Europe, there were tremendous hopes invested that China would be able to rein in Russia. And, that, and the view that in some respects, Putin would never have undertaken this operation without Chinese 
support. And indeed, the fact that some of the modernization of the Russian military has been based on Chinese technology and this hypersonic missile and things, for example. So that what we've seen is, is curiously for a patriot like Putin, a, a sort of um, vassal status developing of Russia vis-a-vis -vis China, um, not uh, which has been compared by some to the, to the position that the Mongols had uh, with Alexander Nevsky. But the, um, the, the question really is now, is there an appetite in China to, given the problems they've got with, with COVID and things, given the sensitivity coming up to the party Congress um, and Xi's position, which may not be as secure as, as, as some people have, have previously uh, thought, um, would they really wish to go this far, and let this crisis continue? That's the first point. I mean, is there really an appetite for the sort of dramatic shift and um, deglobalization that that your scenario would entail uh, if it were to be put into practice to any degree? That's the first question. The second point, which is linked to that, is is there not also a self-correcting mechanism? I mean, you've said that one of the reasons why government bonds have been such a an appalling investment is because of the low interest rate regime, the 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 monetary suppression that has been underway. But of course, if you do get any, even a, to a marginal degree, the sort of disinvestment that is potentially in the pipeline that you've entailed, these yields will rise quite dramatically. And that will therefore change the calculation. How would you see those two points balancing? So I think, I think you raise very valid points on in, in sort of the near term as it relates to domestic Chinese politics, uh, the party Congress coming up, the COVID situation, the potential tenuousness of, of Xi's position relative to those things. And I think all else equal, they probably don't, they probably want more stability than less, right? So I think, I, I, I tend to, I tend to agree with your view there that I, that I think that this is probably suboptimal from a timing perspective for them in the short run. In the long run, I think China understands its vulnerabilities vis-a-vis -vis energy, food, water, the dollar. And I think they understand that, you know, to borrow, to borrow the phrase from the American Revolution, if we don't hang together, we'll all hang separately, which is to say, they may not, the Chinese, I think, are, are trying to balance off the near term, which is this, this crisis is suboptimal from a timing standpoint relative to the COVID crisis, relative to the domestic party Congress, relative to internal political challenges that, that may be occurring. However, this is a fight that is always going to have to happen because otherwise the U.S. is going to use the dollar system to choke out Russia, and then we're going to use the dollar system to choke out China. And then we're going to use the dollar system to choke out Europe, and in per, probably in that order. And so um, that I think is also I think they're, uh, that the Chinese are trying to balance that off. And I think that is why there has been this surprising support or surprising in the West support, despite the inconvenient timing from a short-term perspective. I think they are realizing in the long run. A fight was going to happen, you know. At least now they have some. They, they it, it's happening. It is what it is. Uh, from Russia's perspective, as being a vassal state, you know, here too, in the long run, Russia's looking at collapse if they don't change the dollar system, if they don't change the currency system, if they don't get start getting paid or reserving uh, real assets uh, relative to Western sovereign debt for their energy, right? Because their energy. They're going to run out of energy at some point, and then they're going to be left with a pile of IOUs and the yeah, the cost of those cost of commodities. We don't have to speculate. I've always said, you know, if Russia's oil peaks and starts declining, then the IOUs, the Western IOUs that Russia holds, are going to be a lot less valuable in oil terms. One thing we have absolutely empirically learned in the last two months is if you start taking Russian oil out of the system, the Treasury bonds collapse against oil. Treasury bonds collapse against gas, against palladium, against cobalt, etc. So. I think in the Putin's case, it's a question too of if we don't hang together, we hang separately. Am I a vassal to uh, to China? In a lot of respects, yes. Uh, 
but some of that can just be uh, how you spin it, right? He's also a key linchpin to rebuilding a Eurasia that connects from Vladivostok to, to Portugal. That's been the dream of, of many strategists and the nightmare of, of Anglo-American strategists for 120 years. Uh, and so he can reposition himself as a person that helps build that. And for him, his downside is so great, given his demographics, given his still over-reliance on energy, um, there's a time burn on this. So not only is his energy depleting in, in over time, not, uh, that, but to the extent some new technology is rolled out in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, that significantly increases uh, energy efficiency or reduces fossil fuel usage, um, that, that hurts his leverage. So he, he's, I think, at a point of, of maximum leverage, particularly when you consider what's happening with U.S. shale, right? So to the extent that we had a peak cheap oil scare in 2005 through 2008. We can see that in the price. We can see that in the financial crisis. Uh, shale positively surprised everybody. We, we sort of always knew it was there, but the, the long lateral, steerable laterals, uh, significantly, the U.S. became the world's biggest marginal producer of oil. Where we are now, it's highly unlikely the U.S. is going, can, can address what Russia is doing. And that's been our position the whole time. And what's interesting is we're now eight to 10 weeks into the Russian crisis. Oil prices remain elevated at 25 to 30% above levels where they were trading when the crisis started. U.S. oil production hasn't moved. It has not moved at all. And it's a geology issue. It's a labor issue. It's a, it's a materials issue. Um, and it's a decline rate issue. The, you looked at big four oil, oil basins in the United States, the big four shale basins, and they are declining at a five to 6% per month rate. So they need to increase production by 60 to 70 percent per year on a really big base now just to stay flat. And so I think part of Putin's calculus is, OK, energy efficiency is probably all else equal going to rise over time. That means my power is all going to shrink over time. Uh, shale can't save them now where over the last 10 years, shale could save them. And they can't live without my energy because if they take my energy, the resultant away, the resulting inflation is going to blow up their sovereign debt markets. Uh, it's going to force their central banks into some version of yield curve control. And so if I have to go, I have to go now. And, and then you layer in he's 70. There are rumblings that he may be sick. All of those things only further. No, it's, it's very uh... Or relatively easy to see where Putin is coming from in this in this crisis, and it's um, quite easy to see within limited terms where the Chinese position is. But given your scenario of what the potential consequences of this crisis could be on, particularly the uh, foreign exchange reserves and uh, uh, and the rest, what about the interests of the United States in all of this? I mean, they can't surely wish to see. Uh, a shift away from the dollar towards gold, towards commodities. And I mean, surely the, the power of the United States is the most significant element in this whole story. It's an interesting question. And I think it's a key question because it depends on which United States you're referring to, right? And I say that with a bit of a smile because there are really two United States. There is Washington and Wall Street, and there is the rest of... The United States. And for a lot of the time in the last 50 years, the US military defense intelligence establishment has had its interests aligned with Washington and Wall Street. And so we've seen, broadly speaking, as an oversimplification, over the last 40 years, Wall Street has won, Washington has won, the Defense Department has won in relative wealth terms in the United States, and the rest of the United States has lost uh, dramatically. Uh, middle class, working class have, have, have lost relative to those other interests. What has begun to happen over the last 10 to 12 years uh, and what the U.S. military has been increasingly vocally warning about has shifted the Defense Department's interests away from those of Washington and Wall Street and the dollar system as structured and more in line with the U.S. working and middle classes. Uh, a perfect example of this can be seen. There's a great book by uh, Edward Luce, uh, the, the, the Financial Times reporter, yeah. and he uh, he wrote. He was speechwriter for Larry Summers. A book called um, uh, Le uh, um, Sorry, uh, <laughs> what is Oh, uh, Time to Think. Uh, time to Start yeah. Thinking. Yeah. And and in it, he is uh, he is invited to participate in a high level 
meeting with the uh, some of the most senior military representatives of the United States uh, about strategy. And in 2011, they said, listen, we still have time. The window is still open to reshaping U.S. hegemony where we still have choices. By 2021, we will be out of choices. And what we need to do to fix this is we need to significantly wind down the U.S. military footprint. We need to wind up all wars, specifically in Afghanistan and Iraq. We need to bring a lot of troops home. We need to pull back on our foreign commitments. We need to reinvest into infrastructure, education, supply chains. Uh, we are, are the biggest threat to America is not um, climate change. It is not weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it is our national debt. Right now, we are borrowing money from China to build weapons to face down China. This is not a sustainable strategy. And this is pretty much verbatim what they said in 2011. So we fast forward to 2018 under the Trump administration. And we find uh, a uh, 135, 136 page uh, white paper assessing the US, US defense supply chain. And it goes, I, they, I've only read the unclassified version. There's a classified version as well, which of course I haven't seen. It would be fascinating to read. Uh, but what it says is it just reviews supply chain by supply chain, supply chain, and shows how the US defense supply chain is dangerously either single sourced, dual sourced, or uh, only, you know, only sourced from China. And their point is, is uh, that we are being told that China is the up and coming adversary. We need to prepare to fight China. Obama shifted us to Asia, yet we can't fight a war against China without Chinese supply chains. This is a matter of utmost US national security and I don't specifically mention the dollar in this piece, but if you, if you search the footnotes, what you find are numerous references to the fact that Chinese buying of FX reserves, of treasuries, Chinese buying of treasuries is overvaluing the dollar and undervaluing yuan and thereby allowing the deindustrialization of US defense supply chains. So defense is now looking at the dollar system that forever was seen as a nothing but a strength as a literal act of war by China against the United States. They can, they can defeat the United States in war by simply crushing our supply chains before any war ever starts. And they've effectively done that. And so there's, and, and what's interesting is, is after Biden got elected, who is sort of a system guy, right? We can make the case, okay, under Trump, the Defense Department wrote what the Trump administration officials wanted to see, but they have continued the same thing. They have continued a, uh, pursuing industrial policies related to semiconductors, related to other uh, different critical industries. So I think that when you say it's in America's interest, I think what has happened, and I think the final piece of the puzzle that has really started to change perceptions is I think this view, even in 2018, 2019, was still a minority view. I think in COVID, when COVID happened, and Washington said, okay, we need masks, and we need PPE, we need all this stuff, and mm -hmm. China said, you'll get your masks after we get our masks. Then I think even the most staunch defender of the dollar system as it's been structured in Washington, DC, began to say, wait a second, this isn't just a one-sided benefit to us. This is a real problem. And I think the Defense Department officials were saying, that's what we've been trying to tell you. Are you suggesting that this um, weaponization of the dollar and of the, of the dollar financial system, which has been the most dramatic feature of this crisis, which people say, well, as you, as you said at the beginning, it's a, it's a, a shot that you could use once, but thereafter everybody gets scared uh, for, for its implications. Are you saying that the US has actually been happy to cast this aside and to put, put this at risk because they think it's no longer actually the asset that everybody had assumed it to be? And that in fact, the US would welcome uh, a weaker dollar um, and perhaps, um, a, a, a collapse in the US Treasury market, which would allow, a, 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 in, in some respects, the debt to get a lot, uh, to, be, to be easier to redeem. Um, I mean, a, a structuring in that way of escaping from the trap in which they're in. And the, the, this crisis, is, there is in fact a deeper method um, in, in what the, the United States is currently undertaking in, in this crisis. The defense side, I think, absolutely wants that. I think they absolutely do, at least at a high level in certain certain circles, yes. I think you can look back to the day before these sanctions were rolled out and you can see Jamie Dimon, uh, on, or Jamie Dimon on, on, on TV, on Bloomberg saying, don't weaponize SWIFT, it's a threat to the dollar system. 
You can see Citigroup advising the White House, don't weaponize SWIFT or the dollar system. It's a threat to the dollar system. So I think Wall Street doesn't want anything to, to, to change here. I think the Fed goes with whatever Wall Street wants. And I think Treasury largely goes with whatever Wall Street wants. I think the Defense Department uh, and certain intelligence circles, I think, is absolutely happy. And I think there is some method to the madness um, in terms of uh, being cognizant of what this could trigger, which is, yeah, a change in the thought of how people look at the riskiness of treasury bonds at the sovereign level and basically forcing a crisis where, yeah, yields are going to rise until yields aren't allowed to rise anymore. And the Fed's going to have to put it on their balance sheet and the value of the dollar will be marked down to levels that will allow a reindustrialization, a reshoring of the United States and a rebuilding of the defense supply chain, which defense absolutely wants and absolutely needs if we're going to compete against China. And you think this explains current U.S. Treasury policy, which is very hawkish? Uh, I think possibly. I think it's it's again. I think there's two schools of thought. I think there we are witnessing in real time. I think a bit of an ongoing civil war uh, in terms of policy in the United States, where I think there is still a a, a large group of people that think they can bring Russia and China uh, to bear, uh, or to heal, a better word, excuse me, to heal using yields the way they have, uh, and the dollar the way they have in the past. And so to me, it's hard to tell. I, I, think, that's, I think that's the Occam's razor explanation. I think that side of the house is, is trying to, to the extent there is a geopolitical angle to it, um, I think the I think the bigger side of Treasury and Fed uh, motivations, I think, quite frankly, are strictly domestic politics, which is we have an election coming up. Inflation is polling bad. Quick, do something. And, and I think that's reason number one. Reason number two, I do think there are still some people on that side of the house in the United States, so to speak, that I think want to bring that aren't afraid to use the dollar system or using it as a, as a geopolitical weapon to try to bring Russia and China uh, to bear. Um, and, and so I, I do think it's part of it. I mean, there is potentially a, a silver lining for Wall Street in this. I mean, if you're right, going back to your, your opening remarks, that one of the alternatives to uh, treasury bonds uh, for FX reserves has been obviously equity purchases. You, you mentioned what the Swiss National Bank has been doing, a rather special case, but nevertheless. Um, the uh, If you were to get a significant shift out of, government debt into equity as an alternative uh, form of holding, that could have quite significant implications for market valuations and the, a complete reassessment of the relationship between bonds and, and equities. I think that's right. And I think it's ultimately where this will go, where basically I think we've been seeing sort of a slow motion you know, cramming of the bond market into the stock market, oh, you know, in the QE era, right, which is basically the central banks take the bonds off the market, and mm -hmm. the market moves liquidity into equities. That's, it's generally, you know, with with fits and starts between, you know, QT and trying to unwinding a balance sheet since 2008. But generally, the story of 08 to 2022 has been, uh, or 09 to 2022 has been central banks buy the bonds, and then the, the people that sold the bonds take the cash and put them into riskier assets. And so I, I think that we are in for, I, uh, if I'm right, we will see some relatively compressed period of time where there will be uh, a rather, I think, monumental denouement to, to this, what has been this sort of slow motion move of the bigger bond market into the smaller equity market that I think will be very, very good for equity valuations, asset price valuations. It's going to be really inflationary. I think it'll be a period, you know, and, and where you end up in that at the end of that period is defense is happy <laughs> because they have their supply, the ability to reshore their supply chain. Um, the U.S. debt to GDP is significantly lower just by virtue of GDP rising with nominal, you know, nominally with, with high levels of inflation. Americans feel richer with their stock market. They continue to buy lots of stuff from the people that sell us lots of stuff. And then debt to GDP is, is normalized back to a range from where the Fed can normalize policy without creating these dollar liquidity problems that we've been seeing every time they've tried to tighten since 2008. 
with that the GDP and, and what we're seeing right now, right? We haven't even tightened yet. And you can you can see where the dollar is. You can see the strains already in the treasury market. You can see the strains overseas and in yen, yuan, uh, et cetera. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a great scenario for everybody except somebody who has too much of their net worth in bonds. And, and they'll get paid every day in the road. It's just not going to buy them as much as it used to. Well, the problem is that, that in Europe, I mean, the, the importance of bonds is, is significantly greater than, than, than in the US relative to equities. And you already have several potential crises in the, in the European government bond market, even before this situation arose. Do you see particular problems arising in Europe? Europe is, is <coughs> in a very difficult spot, and that's putting it diplomatically. Um, they are short energy. They get that energy from Putin. They still have these generational ties to the United States. They can't get as cheap of energy from the United States, to, and, they, and, and probably not even in the volumes needed if they cut off Russia. And so they're sort of being forced into a position and and they have the debt levels you talked about. They still have some questions about the banking system that I think have been much more resolved than, than in the U.S. than than in, in the EU. Um, and so they are sort of backing themselves. And, and then geopolitically, to paraphrase Louis Gav, it's it, he's a friend of mine. He, he coined this phrase and it's it's harsh. It's tongue in cheek. But there's a direction of truth to it, which is. The Americans are prepared to fight the Russians down to the last European. And so it's, as, as long as the costs are only borne by the Europeans in this whole thing, we're happy to, to string this thing along and try to try. And so the EU, I think, is in a very, very difficult and outright dangerous spot because they need such low bond yields to kind of keep everything together. They are willingly giving away their energy security uh, out of this political crisis, the virtue signaling back across to the Americans and, and sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, acquiescing to the, the, the U.S. administration's wishes on that front to now. But we have seen a version of this movie before in Europe, right? When the, when the French and the Belgians showed up in the Ruhr Valley and seized Ruhr Valley coal stores from Germany as war reparation and undercut Germany's energy security, um, and the, the Germans said, well, OK, well, we'll just paper over the economy, we'll print money. And we'll make sure the bond market stays solvent by printing more money. And of course, we had one of the famous hyperinflations of all time in Germany that I think ultimately has been forgotten, was tied back at some significant level when it really got crazy to an energy security issue in Germany. And so here we have, again, that's not my base case. I, it's a, a tail risk, but you can see things rhyming. Okay, we've had European energy security significantly compromised. We have the Americans encouraging to to further um, compromise their energy security, to reduce their competitiveness, to, to wear blankets and turn down the, th all of these things. In a situation where the EU already has a post-war like debt to GDP, they already have banking system problems. Um, it's a very dangerous position they're in. And I think ultimately where this is going to go is the Europeans are gonna have to make a choice. Do we choose Europe and energy security and sort of, you know, eat, eat our lima beans and go with Putin? Or do we commit economic suicide effectively to some degree that at the extreme could be a hyperinflation type scenario of the euro and go with the Americans? Um, well, the test for this surely will be uh, policy towards the war. And it, it's qu quite clear that in continental Europe, there is a desire for a deal at some point over the Ukraine, that um, the much stronger line taken by the United States um, is not as popular in Germany or France, to put it mildly. <laughs> there is a belief that in some respects, uh, the Ukraine should accept some form of accommodation with Russia. In return, obviously, for being able to join the EU and, and having European financial support for reconstruction and all the rest. I mean, but it's not really clear whether, on the one hand, the United States, and on the other hand, China, um, is willing to see this sort of accommodation. And I think this is going to be the test, is whether there is any form of strategic autonomy left in Europe. Uh, we've had the re-election of, of uh, President Macron. We've had 
elections in Germany quite recently, even though the, this current crisis has made the coalition in Germany quite fragile in some respects. Um, but you have got, nevertheless, in the two main countries, a period of new, relatively new or very new leadership, which does give an opportunity. And there is tremendous pressure for the, on the Europeans because of the existential factors that you mentioned. I suppose the crucial issue is going to be whether we get an early end to this war or whether the scenario that seems to be favored at the moment, that this is going to be a sort of permanent um, running saw along the lines of, of the RAND report in, in 2019 of, of turning the Ukraine into another um, Afghanistan, in fact, for, for the Russians and indeed by extension for the Chinese. Uh, um, what is your, your gut feeling at the moment about how this is going to, going to work out? My gut feeling is that Europe, led by the Germans and the French, to your point, are trying to delicately ride two horses with one with one ass, so to speak, from a yeah. strategic standpoint. Because I think they understand, and in particular in Germany, they understand that their economic future uh, is east, not west, to, to, to sort of having German industrial goods being shipped into uh the, the Belt and Road to, as a broad oversimplification and, and understanding that there are significant eventual competitive issues with China, in, in intellectual property issues, all those things that you always run into when you deal with the Chinese, the Germans are aware of, but I think it's the devil you know versus, you know, the one you're going to have to face down the road. So I think they understand, they, the, the Germans and the French understand the future strategically is east more than west. Um, the challenge is the, the near term trying to placate to these historic uh, transatlantic ties with the U.S. administration and, and, and balancing those two things. My gut tells me that eventually Europe is going to have to go uh, with Eurasia. That basically, they are going to have to cast their lot with a Eurasian um, uh, um, the Eurasian dream, whatever, whatever you want to call it, uh, out of economic necessity. And that's going to be an interesting moment in history for the U.S. because at that point, McKinder, the McKinder theory will have, have you know, yeah. it, it have become a, a strategic nightmare for the U.S. But between here and there, we're in this limbo zone. Now, it's a really interesting point you raise about these elections because I think if we think about this strategic issue tactically, tactical issue number one, to your point, is, is okay, French, German political situations are relatively new, which means they should be relatively stable to be able to make some sort of deal. Uh, does this open a window for the Chinese to come in and play uh, a deal maker, supplant the US, which would be another huge moment, I think, in terms of geopolitics, where they bring Russia to the table, they bring the Europeans and the Ukrainians to the table, and they agree on something within, and they reassert uh, some sort of strategic geopolitical uh, independence. That, to me, is, is very possible. And then the other tactical thing, I think, is uh, the, 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 the realities of weather. Right? This is all fun and games for the Europeans to play all tough with Putin in April, in May, in June. Mm -hmm. You start getting those cold nights at the end of September, October, you know, six months from now, five months from now, it's going to start to be a very different domestic situation politically. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to let, you know, wake up to your crying baby in the cold at night too many times before you're going to start seeing domestic political disruption. Now, interestingly, for the U.S., there's probably elements in Washington like, OK, great. That's how it goes. That's OK. If you know, the only thing we don't want probably is the scenario where China comes in as peace broker and brokers a deal that works out for the EU, for Russia, for China, for Ukraine, uh, because that's a huge, that's a huge, I think, uh, I think that's a huge shift. So those, you've got sort of the strategic long term, the tactical near term, and then sort of these signposts or these tactical sort of triggers, right? You've got a stable political situation. I think between now and when it starts to get cold, I think if we still got nothing, it starts to get cold. I think the political situations in France and Germany probably start to get much more disruptive um, internally or much more in unstable internally. I, I think that's a very interesting uh, analysis. Could we end perhaps by, by asking you a, a political question about the United States, uh, which is 
frequently completely misunderstood in, in Europe. Um, because the next big political event, of course, is the way in which the elections are going to go in, in the United States, and in particular looking forward to the next presidential election. You described this split debate in, 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 in US strategic interests between Wall Street and, and um, on the one hand, and the, the military on, on the other. To what extent does that reflect um, the red-blue debate politically in America? <laughs> and if we are to anticipate, as many people do, a, a return of the Republicans, um, and maybe even a presidency, um, how, how would that affect all that we've been discussing? It's a great question. Um, I'm sure you've seen the political maps in the 2016 election of the United States, red versus blue, right? Yeah. Which is vast stretches of red with little specks of blue, but the specks of blue tend to be the big urban population centers. And that's kind of the political story of the United States. That electoral map tends to mirror the relative representation of the military. In other words, you know, there tend to be vastly overrepresented from what I would call flyover country or, uh, you know, yee yee country, as, as they jokingly call yeah. it, right? These rural conservative areas um, and, and working class, uh, uh, then there are people from the military from Manhattan and downtown Chicago and, and Los Angeles, et cetera. So I think this split is actually that we referred to before, I think is really actually a manifestation. I think it's actually a lagged manifestation of that electoral map now happening in policy. So I think the leading indicator was, was Trump, right? Where all of a sudden the deindustrialization of the US, the working class, the middle class had gotten so bad that they actually basically threw a Molotov cocktail into the US electoral system by electing Trump. It wasn't that anybody really loved him. It was just that he, he, the establishment hated him so much. He literally would got, I think, a lot of his votes because people said, if, if they hate him that much, then, I wanna, then, then he's my guy. And so I think this strategic separation or the strategic uh, disagreement between the military and sort of Wall Street and, and certain elements in Washington, the dollar, you know, the dollar sort of group in Washington, uh, status quo group in Washington, I think breaks down along those lines. So I think you're going to see, you know, military, working class, a lot of the middle class, um, all in favor of sort of this um, America first and not in the in America first racist or, or, or some of the, the negative connotations of that, but simply in the strategic aspect of it, of what was discussed by the military in 2011 in Luce's book, which is, look, we have a window where we are in serious trouble. We can do something in this window. And after that window, our, our choices are going to be limited. And that includes pulling back and reinvesting in America and, and these types of things. So uh, I, I think the elections this fall, barring something crazy, I think I, I agree with what you're seeing a lot of. I imagine you're seeing over there, but what we're seeing here, which is the, the Democrats are going to lose a ton of seats in, in the House of Representatives. I think they're going to lose a lot of seats in the Senate. Uh, I think at that point, Biden will effectively be a lame duck, uh, unable to do really anything substantial on his, on his policy options. And then that takes us another two years to the next election. And that, that starts to get interesting because I don't, I mean, Biden, I, I don't think even the Democrats want to run. I, I, I think he is wildly unpopular even within his own party. I, there are questions, I think rightfully so, unfortunately, about his actual, where he is from his mental faculties. And I think those questions, while harsh, are rightfully need to be asked. There, I, I don't think his vice president, unlike past situations in the United States, right, where we had Bush run after Reagan and we had Gore run after Clinton, she might be more unpopular than him politically. And I, I, I hear from what people that do much more of the politics stuff that, that I think she's seen internally as a lightweight. So then you're, at this point, 
you've almost got two sort of unknowns. I think you could, there are fears that Trump will run again. There are hopes that DeSantis, the Florida governor, will run from the Republican side. And from the Democrat side, I don't know who they run. Come on, simplify this in saying that, broadly speaking, a Republican administration up next would be a weak dollar administration, whereas a uh, a Democrat one would be a strong dollar administration, or would it be the other way around? I mean, how would they, how would that, That's in terms really of the question. policy choices that you were outlining in, in earlier? I think it would be a weak, I think a Republican, I think a Republican president in 2024, whether it's DeSantis, I don't think it's Trump, but Trump or DeSantis, just for sake of discussion, I think is going to be a weak dollar president with a wide backing of the U.S. Defense Department and sort of flyover country um, and to the loud screams of of Wall Street, at least until the stock market starts flying. And then they'll probably just shut up and, and, and you know, count their money as the stock market flies with the weaker dollar and the reinvestment, and the capital flowing here to reinvest uh, in U.S. infrastructure. I think it'll be really good for the U.S. It's just going to be really bad for bondholders. Yeah. Yeah. A last supplementary question, which is I has been burning in me, which is uh, crypto. Does this have any place in your um, various scenarios? And uh, we've seen, obviously, um, Elon Musk taking over Twitter. There have been some suggestions that this is a crypto play of some kind. Do you have any view on those two things? So for me, I am focused strictly on Bitcoin as crypto, and I think Bitcoin yeah. has been and will continue to serve as a neutral reserve asset for the people. It has an energy tie to it, to the fact that the mm. proof of work algorithm requires you to expend energy. So it is, you know, there is a there is a, a, a an energy tie to Bitcoin in the same way there's an energy tie to mine gold. It's a proof of work neutral yeah. reserve asset that floats. So I, I, I like Bitcoin. I own some Bitcoin. I think everybody should own a little little bit of Bitcoin because the volatility to your point earlier is extraordinary. Uh, so I don't, I don't think you need very much so, Bitcoin, but I think just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the policy side, there's some- As a reserve asset, potentially. Replacing as a reserve asset, right. So it's, there's some really interesting things that you could game theory out, which, for example, we're seeing the shift by Russia to effectively bring gold back into the system. It's been happening. It's getting more explicit in, in response to this crisis. The Chinese have obviously been stockpiling large amounts of gold for a long time. But if you look at a chart of gold versus Bitcoin, gold over the life of Bitcoin has consistently fallen at, a, at an exponential rate, at a logarithmic rate. And furthermore, you've seen the Chinese kick miners out, Bitcoin miners out last year, my understanding is that it was heavily due to it being a power issue. And the power issue was heavily marginally due to it being a water issue. And so there's this interesting game theory where if the Chinese and the Russians want to change the game back to a neutral reserve asset, a move that the U.S. Defense Department actually doesn't mind that we want because we need it as a national security issue. But we don't necessarily want to give away the farm, and because they've got as much gold relative to their uh, relative to their their monetary base, their economies, etc., relative to us, then there's a trump card we could play, which is okay. We're not going to use gold. We're going to use Bitcoin. It's transparent. It's it's more finite. It's instantly transportable. It's auditable. It's all these things that that you can sort of ding against gold, and incredibly or, or, or leverage wise, it requires a nation to consume a lot of power. And for China, it then stresses China's water issues because a lot of China's base load power is hydropower. So I, 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 you know, I think the time between here and there, I think there are probably little groups at the Pentagon thinking about this and it's three guys and they're talking about it, but it's, it could the be- The power issue that people, um, normally talk about in relation to Chinese attitudes towards crypto and, um, is the political power issue that they, uh, the Chinese government is frightened of the loss of control that would be entailed in, in such a, an autonomous uh, financial instrument. It, and it's, for them, I, it depends ultimately really on, on the economic management, right, of, of, of their economy. If they run massive deficits and everyone's scared into Bitcoin, they run a structurally inflationary policy, that's a problem. But I think, I, I do think they probably dislike that to a certain degree. 
But I think the real issue is much more fundamental. I think it's they have power problems because they have water problems that are getting acute. And so America is the Saudi Arabia water. We've got plenty of water. So we could, in a roundabout way, stress China's water issue by saying, all right, you guys want gold? Let's use Bitcoin. And and, um, that's an interesting, it's an interesting strategic concept, but there's a long time between. Well, with that uh, very intriguing thought, uh, Luke, I want to thank you very, very much for what has been really a fascinating discussion. And uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Many oh, thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate yeah. it. Enjoyed talking with you.